The pop culture phenomenon Twilight is a movie franchise that is based on the hit book series that is based on the horny thoughts of some lady who decided to be a writer, I guess. We are finally looking at the first Twilight movie from 2008 where we follow cool, irresistible dork Bella as she falls for an eternally 17-year-old vampire named Edward. Although if you watch the movie on mute, it can also be seen as the story of a girl and her alabaster face paint being accepted into a troop of mimes with weirdly obvious wigs. If these immortal vampires were really trying to blend in with society all of this time, they probably would have learned how to use bronzer over the last 50 years. But instead, they all come to school every day with a full-on Victorian beat and blood-stained lips. Edward even has tiny fangs and hair that's shaped like a bat taking flight. I don't know how these weren't the first people burned at the stake in the 1600s, but I guess it's too late now. What all what always surprises me about the Twilight movie is how they took no effort to elevate the writing to the standard of its $40 million production, and also how a $40 million production can look pretty cheap with just a few bad decisions on the part of the director, cinematographer, and production designer. Add in a cast of soon-to-be A-list actors who took this job without knowing how big it would become, and you're ready to sink your fangs in and start sucking. This movie franchise also start sucking right away by normalizing a whole plethora of bad filmmaking and manipulation tactics, a main character whose wrestling name would be the Stammer Hammer, and visuals that will distract you at every turn, from the intentionally pale adult teenagers to the cheap blue winterfresh filter that was slapped over every scene. So gather your red blood cells and get rid of all the garlic at your house, because it's time to sacrifice ourselves at the altar of twilight light for an impossibly fast and strong installment of Clip Breakdown. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web. And we break it into little clips, just like you have to rip apart a vampire to kill it. Apparently, that's the thing. I don't know about what happened to a stake through the heart. I think it's very interesting how Edward Cullen and his clan have been around for hundreds of years, yet have never found a way to rise to political power. Even Dracula was a count and he dressed weird. But luckily, you, me, any one of us can get our own fancy prefix using established titles. Established titles is a project based in the historic Scottish custom of naming landowners either ladies or lords. You can buy a plot of land as little as one square foot so that you can also be a lord or lady. But also, established titles has committed to planting a tree with every order a fun way to help preserve the gorgeous woodlands of Scotland while also helping reforestation efforts. My lord. For her birthday, I decided to make my mother a lady. I mean, she was already a lady, but now she can put it on actually like her plane tickets and her credit cards. Plus she gets this awesome framed certificate with a crest. You got a unique plot number. I was kind of surprised by how much my mom loved hearing that she was officially a lady and it felt good to let her know that there was also a tree planted in her name. The first 200 people to use my link for established titles, all of our plots of land will be very close. So we're sort of building our own empire of clip breakdown. Right now, population is just my mom. It makes an amazing last minute gift and established titles is actually running a massive sale right now. Plus, if you use the code Duramio, you get an additional 10% off. Go to establishedtitles.com slash Duramio to start your gift shopping early and also help support the channel. Thanks, established titles, for making my mom my lady. <laughs> As I mentioned, this movie is not well written and it's also not a good adaptation of the novel or of any novel. Don't start with narration. I'd never given much thought to how I would die, but dying in the place of someone I love 
Seems like a good way to go. Yeah, we can actually hear how you didn't put much thought into that. You think a life or death ultimatum is a good way to go? Because to me, that seems like a worst case scenario. Bella is so damaged that she saw Sophie's choice and got jealous of the kid Sophie didn't choose. I get that dying in place of someone you love would be a brave and noble way to go. But to me, a good way to go would be passing peacefully in my sleep after eating an entire appetizer trio from Applebee's by myself. Just wait a while before you cremate my body, however, or it will explode like a propane tank. I always talk about how it feels to me, cheap and lazy, to open your movie with pointless narration that doesn't feel connected to anything. Hollywood loves to do it, but I have never hated it or meant how much I hate it as much as in the Twilight series. They just have Kristen Stewart reading like full paragraphs of prose. They'll just take lines from the book and then turn them into dialogue even when nobody in real life talks like that. Also, some of you may have noticed that I edit my movie clips down for brevity, which is important because actors in movies love to take their time. I guess stage actors do it too. That's why every play is one million years long. But Twilight is an entirely different ball game. If Bella alone started speaking at a normal rate, the whole movie would be 90 minutes as opposed to two hours. Here's the same clip I just showed you without any cuts. Tell me this isn't excessive. I'd never given much thought to how I would die. but dying in the place of someone I love. That's the ghost of Bambi's mom after getting hunted with a shotgun. We haven't even established a human character on screen yet. That's why this disembodied narration feels like it's the inner monologue of that actual deer. And that's actually a movie I would rather see. Just animals living their lives and pontificating about death. Although George Orwell could never make it this sexy or unnaturally cool toned. So then we flash over to the great state of Arizona, which which is where, oh yeah, also that deer gets hunted by an unseen person who gives it a bear hug. But that's not where the movie starts, so okay. The movie starts with our main character, Bella, played by Kristen Stewart, in her hometown of Phoenix, Arizona. This is the warmest part of the whole movie. The only time you'll ever see like an orange tinge to the environment, and even then, it's mixed in a different way. She cuts off a piece of her favorite cactus and then hits the road. In the state of Washington, under near constant cover of clouds and rain. There's a small town named Forks. This is where I'm moving. My dad's Charlie. He's the chief of police. Normally this is the part where I would scream defund the police, but then I got a look at Charlie the sad dad over here who is always drinking a beer and wearing snow boots. And I got the strong feeling that this is one police who was already defunded. I, again, hate that there's nothing motivating Bella's voiceover other than us just reading a character's mind, which is something you do in books, not movies. I'm becoming Jim Carrey with my head movements or something. There's also nothing to explain why as a human, Bella already has the same deadpan delivery and self-indulgent word choices as a centuries-old vampire. Wait till she gets bit. She really said, In fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny. Stephanie Meyer was on set like, uh, I think you mean new moon to me. I get that you're depressed, Bella, but please stop live journaling about how Forks Washington is under a near constant cover of clouds and rain, because that's definitely not true enough for it to be safe for vampires to live there. Wikipedia tells me that the real Forks Washington gets about 212 rainy days a year. Doesn't say anything about it being completely hidden from the outside world by a perpetual hurricane like Skull Island if just being in the sunlight could expose the Cullen family as vampires, then their secret identity depends way too much on the weather and the mistaken belief that clouds don't move. I just gotta say, it feels really thin to me, Stephanie. Like, I think you're confusing a light drizzle for a nuclear winter. Anyway, Bella, you can tell, doesn't spend much time with her dad. She's like, I came here all the time when I was little, but I haven't been in years. It's like, well, how many years? Cause you're only 16, so it could be like five years. Is it five years? <laughs> <laughs> say how many years. You're too young to not say how many years. Also, it's like, we don't know your life. Give us your backstory. Not specific enough. You can tell things are a little uncomfortable with her and her dad, but she does like that he gives her space. Sales lady picked up the, the bed stuff. You like, you like purple, right? Purple's cool.
Bella is holding that dinky little succulent like it is her baby in utero, which I get it. It's probably very clever direction to show that she's clutching on to the last piece of her home in Arizona that she has. But I'm left to wonder, are the cacti literally the only thing you're going to miss about Arizona? Because she doesn't seem to be leaving any friends behind and her mom doesn't miss her enough to even find her phone charger. I would have loved it if the movie could have added a couple of beats showing what Bella's life and personality were like in a more familiar environment, like a going away party or her last day of school before moving. Why does she miss home so much? Like maybe back home, she didn't act like a dour widow with the personality of an answering machine. I don't know, I don't know, we don't see it. I'm not saying in Arizona she should have been the class clown, but maybe introducing her and we see her being a little more outgoing than she is during her time in Forks, it would help us see that her shyness is more about being uncomfortable and she has a hard time making friends, which is more relatable and realistic than her just being like, oh, I'm such a dork that I just like to read books and talk to my plants. Like we would have an understanding of why she has this colder, more aloof personality in the movie, which fun fact was actually Kristen Stewart's real personality that she brought from home. That's no shade. I believe Kristen Stewart does a remarkably good job with a character that could have easily seemed flat due to the flatness of the character. I can always tell that Kristen Stewart is working hard to perform these sometimes ridiculous lines in a way that makes sense internally for her. She is who she is and she brings it to the characters, which I think is fun to watch throughout these movies. Why should she care what society thinks? For years, every time she was seen swimming in the ocean with a hot lady, TMZ was always like, oh my God, girls trip. It's like, they're having sex on the sand. Do not erase the queer power couples. Not on my expensive vacation photo shoot. Okay, so it's time to meet Jacob, played by Taylor Lautner, who many people think looks like me. I was born first. Believe it or not, I'm old. Anyway, Jacob's dad, they're both from the reservation nearby. They are giving Bella a truck that her dad bought for her. After I ram you in the ankle. <laughs> yeah, bring it. Hi, I'm, I'm Jacob. We, uh... We used to make mud pies when we were little. Cool, one second though, cause both of our dads just stopped what they were doing to go into the middle of an active street in Rough House. Excuse me, grown men, can you come finish the conversation you were having with me please? And remember, we only play Power Rangers in the house or in the backyard. Come on. Your homecoming present. This? Just bought it off Billy here. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is perfect. Okay, I didn't say she deserved an Oscar for every line delivery, but still. You would also feel compelled to act a little bit like a weirdo if you were wearing that outfit. Plaid cap sleeves over a long sleeve thermal. How tasteful. It looks like she's wearing one of those modesty bathing suits that the Duggars would wear to the beach. Bella Thorne, no. What's her last? Bella Swan. She stays wearing fitted long sleeve shirts. Like she got a gift card to Delia's this weekend. The movie makes mortals seem super boring and uninteresting and Bella is just like this jewel, this crown jewel of the school from the minute she gets there. Also, I didn't see all the Twilight movies, but I do have a friend who was weird in high school named Brittany who explained all of these to me. And I think we later get a reason why Bella is like so special amongst humans. But in this movie, she's just like a normal girl who is certainly no less pretty than the other actresses, but is like treated as though she's Jennifer Aniston just walked into a Kmart. The boys are I'll really want to get to know her. Oh, Anna Kendrick is in this movie and I am obsessed with her. She's so great. Aren't people from Arizona supposed to be like really tan? Maybe that's why they kicked me out. <laughs> 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 You're good. That's me trying to do my Robert De Niro impression. You're good. You're good, kid. Ooh. I guess Bella's joke about being kicked out of Arizona was supposed to be an example of how witty and funny she is, which it would be if that line were written by an actual 16-year-old rather than an adult professional with a book deal. However, this scene does feel accurate in that the bar is set very low if you wanna make straight people think you're funny. Like some guy from group therapy will be like, man, that story you told was so funny. And I'm like, my struggles with bulimia? Great, glad you enjoyed it, Bradley. Not that I'm complaining, keep laughing, straighties. <laughs> If you're straight and you watch this, you're not one of the straights that I hate. The girls who get it, get it. So that guy, I think his name was Mike. He is all over Bella. So is the guy who does the school video. No, he's like the DJ. They all have a little bit of character to them. You watch this and you're like, okay, I know they're gonna somehow be in every movie. 
so I'll just get used to it. <laughs> Torito, my friend. Hey, Mikey, you met my homegirl, hey. Bella. Oh, you're, you're, you're homegirl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. My girl. <laughs> if I were Bella, I would be like, um, can anyone in here please fucking cool it? Nobody has wanted their first time to be with one of the Three Stooges since 1951 when it actually carried some clout. Kissing someone you don't know on the cheek without permission is a very weird behavior and I would be up in the principal's office with his name and number. I would also report Mike for the melodramatic way that he interacts with his scene partner, that burrito. You want a burrito, my friend? What are you ta- who are you? This whole school is Bella's biggest fan. Chase her down until you love me. Smile. Okay, sorry, I needed a candidate for the future. Cool, your headline can be, new girl comes to school in a bowling uniform, comma, acts like she has a secret for no reason. Bella immediately is like, no, 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 no pictures, please, I'm too shy. Meanwhile, I would have been like, oh, you need a candidate, well, let me get ready for it. <laughs> take a picture there and put it in your school newspaper. Bella's like, please don't feature me. I'm the shy girl. Mm, I'm lonely girl 365 on MySpace. You know, you can always go for eating disorders, speedo padding on the swim team. <laughs> Actually, that's a good one. Oh, is it Angela? You think writing an article about the genitals of your classmates is a good idea for the school newspaper? Don't listen to Bella, okay? Her lunch is sucking the moisture out of a celery stick. We're nine minutes in. I feel like I've been at this four days, but that's okay because the Colin family is just about to get introduced and we can maybe kick off this four part series. Anna Kendrick's character, whose name I can't remember yet, Jessica. She's telling uh, Bella who all of the Colin members are. They're like a thing. I'm not even sure that's legal. Jess, they're not actually related. Yeah, but they live together, it's weird. Jess, it is not weird that your fellow high schoolers are living in a group home, but it is weird that your fellow high schoolers are 26 years old and put on white body paint to go to the cafeteria. It is um a little confusing that they are like all pretend to be a family but are openly dating. I'm not sure a book for young adults needs that type of complicated storyline, like don't, don't do that. Alice, she's really weird. Um, she's with Jasper, the blonde one who looks like he's in pain. Dr. Collins like this foster dad slash matchmaker. <laughs> Maybe he'll adopt me. Oh, really, Angela? You want your parents to neglect you so you can f your pale foster brother? Go off, I guess, but you're bringing a real weird energy to the lunch table today, gotta say. I love how, right as Jessica is saying that Alice is weird, you see her in the background ballroom dance walking her way to the milk cooler. Alice, she's really weird. I'd be like, wow, the kids at this school are clearly not bullying each other enough because that's the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. The cream of the crop for the Cullen family is Edward Colin, the one that all the girls love because he's the hottest, whitest, tallest, and most uh, single. Also emotionally unavailable, which really gets me sweating. Speaking of sweat and odor, Bella feels a little less than fresh when she joins the class and Edward doesn't help. Hi, I'm Tess. Thank you. Everyone meet your new classmate. First name Bella, last name P Stench. She said, okay, note taken. I'm gonna cancel the auto replenishment on my beef scented Kotex. I just wanted all the dogs in my new neighborhood to trust me. It's hilarious to me that Edward basically gags and covers his nose, but the director was like, hmm, it's just not obvious enough that the fan is what wafted Bella's smell into his face. Let's tie some streamers to it, like in a cartoon. That way it reads for the audience. Again, I feel that the makeup artist really overcompensated here, making people look pale, because the color correctionist obviously did some work washing out the skin tones as well. And now Edward just looks green. Oh yeah, and the movie does a lot of those weird, quick, sudden dissolves to random visuals in the middle of some scenes. It feels like when Google all of a sudden sends me a video slideshow it made of pictures I took in a 2014 drug binge. Here's a spotlight from some special memories of that horrible time. It doesn't take long before Edward storms out of the class. Bella is really not handling the fact that someone at this school is not obsessed with her the way she is used to. Okay. Uh, every class is full. I'm afraid you'll have to stay in biology. Just have to endure it.
Like, didn't you have something to do in the office as well? Why are you leaving? The secretary is like, mm, I think she forgot to get her insulin out of the mini fridge. Oh, well, good luck out there, sweetie. Bella starts meeting some of the locals when she's having dinner at ye old diner or whatever with her dad. You remember me? I played Santa one year. I bet I made an impression though, didn't I? <laughs> Butt crack, Santa. <laughs> Hear that, Cora? That's the nervous laughter of a customer who was not expecting their server to say the word butt crack to them. Did you not even look at those flashcards your manager gave you with hospitality keywords? Also, in case you didn't realize that Bella was a vegetarian when she tried to absorb that celery stalk through her skin, Stephanie Meyer made it clear by having characters throughout the story forcefully name drop a wide variety of plant-based dishes. Let the girl eat her garden burger. One mushroom ravioli. I ordered you this French salad, I hope that's okay. You should order one for yourself next time. Oh, you mean like the identical salad that's also on his plate? You asshole. Even though they don't have meat, most people would still call those things burgers, ravioli, and salads, which was also the menu at the wedding of one of my trashiest cousins. I'm just kidding. I don't, I know my cousins sometimes watch this show. You don't have to invite me to your wedding. I understand how snobby I sound. Eh, so yeah, the whole town, what are they talking about? Nothing. There's just some awkward tension when Bella grabs a ketchup and the dad grabs A1 steak sauce. Anyway, that night Bella finally talks to her mom. I don't know how long she's been at this new, new school. Mom doesn't seem too concerned. I didn't lose my power cord. It ran away. <laughs> I miss you. Oh, baby, I miss you too. I mean, apparently not enough to grab a new iPhone cord from a gas station over the last month, but still, honey, I miss you so much. How could I not? You bring so much personality to the room. At the beginning, Bella mentions that her mom decides to travel the country with her minor league baseball boyfriend, which to me sounds highly unusual. I think usually the baseball season is not year long from what I understand, and the players often just travel without their spouses. So to me, it's Seems like Bella's mom could not wait to get away from her. She was like, go to a boring place and be boring over there. Ella's having brief flashes of Edward's pale eye area because she is just hot under the collar that he thought she smelled. I plan to confront him and demand to know what his problem was. Me, when the promotional model at Abercrombie and Fitch doesn't smile back. Even after I give him my special look. <sighs> it's how lizards communicate their desire to mate. They don't make the sound though. That's a big end special. The friends, the friends, the mortal friends, they're like, Bella, come to the car hop with us or whatever. And she's like, I can't, reading. It's like, Pfft. Okay. But then all of a sudden, Edward doesn't come to school for the next few days, so she can't confront him. And it's really hard to not see someone you want to talk to for an unspecified amount of time still. More days passed. Oh, they did? Great screenwriting. I needed that information verbally because I didn't know how days work. And what in the meatless Monday is Bella having for lunch now? The leftovers of someone's basil and pesto pasta bowl? You can tell when a movie set has a food stylist and you can tell when a movie just has the set dresser who's already like overworked, just like, all right, here's some salad in a bowl with three cherry tomatoes. Vegetarianism. So Edward's still not there. We also flash out to a scene which, you know, just a, a soliloquy type of thing where a guy who works at a mill or a construction site or whatever is attacked by a group of shadowy figures. So there's trouble afoot. The next scene, Ella is adorably clumsy by smashing her tailbone and her dad's like a wild animal attack down at the ye old factory. They are folksy here. So I say ye old a lot as though they're from Camelot. By the way, this movie was mostly shot in Oregon, 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 but they also really shot in Forks, Washington, which brought because the book series itself brought a lot of tourism to the city. And I thought it was interesting. They shot on location, but you know, it's hard to replicate kind of those temperate rainforest things. Bella cannot deal with her stupid classmate. Listen, um, I was wondering, did you have a, a, a date to- What's up, Arizona, huh? <laughs> uh, Are you liking the rain, girl? Bella seems like the kind of girl who would pretend to think it's funny that he just splashed her, but in her head, she's panicking because she woke up at five to curl her hair like that. Worth the time, it came out great. Oh, this is just more of society letting girls know that if a guy likes you, he's gonna be mean to you and physically harm you. Like I remember in high school, really seeing straight guys try to flirt with girls by dumping their backpack into the trash can 
and punching them in the breast. I always felt so bad that girls would just be like, <laughs> stop it, Jason, you're so crazy. Like, yeah, he actually might be. He's gonna murder his wife one day, go report him. That's how I feel about how you likened the rain girl guy. How you likened the rain girl? Mm -mm. Not enough for you to talk to me in that type of tone. To her surprise, Edward comes a strutting in as though he didn't just get five days off because of mono. He's much nicer to her today. He's like much nicer to her. I would be like, okay, great. So it's gonna be an anxious attachment style relationship. Looking forward to those therapy sessions. I am looking back like there is nothing really redeemable about this relationship. It's very toxic. Not that that hasn't been portrayed in movies and books before. Romeo and Juliet, that was a toxic relationship that gets romanticized all the time. But to me, Edward is just like, he has a lot of the worst behaviors and, and they really let Bella love them. And moreover, I know kids who read these books because I was in high school at the time, idolized Edward. They were like, he's the most romantic person ever. It's like, he makes it seem like that, but he's really ruining someone's life. So you're enjoying the rain? Well, I don't really like the rain. All right, well, damn. I don't think he realized how difficult that would be for you to answer. He said, so do you like rain? And she was like, <laughs> F me. I don't, I wasn't prepared for hardball questions. Like, what does this part even mean? Any cold, wet thing, I don't really. Edward's like, oh, you hate cold, wet things? Then uh, I've got some bad news for you about the temperature and moisture level of my undead vampire d Yet here you are, quivering with desire at the lab table in front of me. I think it's supposed to be showing that Edward gets really tongue-tied around him. She's a little entranced by his eyes. Oh, and she asks him in the hallway, she's like, your eyes were black the other day, now they're like the most golden honey shade. And he's like, it's contact, it's allergies. I'm like, this is all stuff that anyone could have noticed over the last hundred years that Edward's been a vampire. I guess Bella's the only observant person on earth. Hmm. When Bella's getting into her car, Edward is literally staring her down from across the parking lot. I would be like, okay, I thought he was cute, but now I'm scared. But no, anything scary Edward does, Bella is like, mm, I hear wedding bells. Although it's a good thing he's staring when this goes down because an accident happens. <laughs> Bella is so not like other girls. She survives her van accidents. Has anyone thought about how if this were any other girl in school with, I guess, normal smelling blood, Edward would not have even bothered to save her life. If that was Anna Kendrick's character standing there, he would have let the whole school watch as she popped like a water balloon between two vehicles. And it becomes an ensemble piece focusing on the students of Forks as they try to grapple with this horrible tragedy that they witnessed. The girl who got smashed like a stepped on sand Sandwich. And the sad thing is, it was her own fault she died because she wasn't as intriguing as Bella and Edward didn't find her smell as weird in a good way. Therefore, her life was worthless. I'm just saying, can we see Edward do a really good deed for someone else to show that he's like actually selfless? Because that would explain his motivation to basically not eat any humans. He like clearly has some affection for humans or some reason to not want to eat them, which is why they all do animal blood. But we don't see selfless or him really pay attention to a single other person other than Bella. But anyway, Bella meets Edward's dad, a, like adopted dad, whose name is Carlisle. He looks to be in his early 30s, yeah. And then his next youngest child looks to be in his late 20s, so something, the math ain't mathin'. Anyway, he's checking her out and he's like, you're very lucky. And he, she's like, well, it's cause your son's a fucking demon. And he's like, anyway, off you go. Then in the hallway, Bella's like, what was that to Edward? How did you get over to me so fast. I was standing right next to you, Bella. No, you were next to your car. No, well, I wasn't. <sighs> you hit your head. I think you're confused. Okay, I know the term gaslighting gets thrown around a lot on the internet, but how is Edward going to stand face to face with someone he supposedly cares for and act as though he has no idea what she's talking about when she asks him what lipstick he's wearing? It's not 1918, Eddie. There's no shame in wearing makeup. Bella, sweetie, try the shade Berry Noir from Lancome because apparently Edward wants the whole school to believe that he's not wearing David Bowie drag right now. Seriously though, why did he just try to 
to convince Bella that she hit her head when clearly, no, she didn't. And I think Bella would know that for herself. She seems like the kind of girl who suffered head injuries before. Although I do appreciate Kristen Stewart's no makeup look for this. We've seen some real weird no makeup looks, which, you know, it's hard to make no blush look intentional, but they really do it here. And she, I mean, just has such natural beauty that she literally could have no makeup on and still be camera ready. I stand Kristen Stewart. Also, people were like, look back and are like, oh, her acting was so bad in this movie. It's like, no, I think the, the writing was really bad. I truly believe she was a great actor in this, but also it's like not that surprising for Kristen Stewart to have been, remember she, when she used to like be in a lot of bad movies? She was in that horror movie where her toddler little brother and there was a shadow demon in the basement, Cornfield. Also, she played the older sister in Zathora in which she was frozen in a block of ice for most of it. Panic Room, great breakout role for her. The kids are at a field trip to the greenhouse where people are kind of surprised that Edward is talking to them. And what does he say? He basically comes up with all of these new theories all of a sudden explaining how he stopped a van with his bare hands. He's like, oh, I looked it up. An adrenaline rush kept me. And she was like, okay. Anna Kendrick is so cute. She comes up she's like, Mike asked me to the dance. Is that weird? And I was like, no, thank God someone's taking him. And then when they're getting on the bus, that weird girl, Alice with the hair, <laughs> Josie and the pussycats, as I like to call her, she's like, oh, hi, Bella, are you gonna ride with us? And Edward's like, no, she's a dumb idiot who can't come. Because he's trying to like stay away from her because at the lunchroom after they reenact the book cover with an apple He's like, what if I'm not the hero? I'm I'm the villain and she's like I love a villain when it f me raw <laughs> That's what she says. She's like, let's say for conversations like that I'm not smart and I did still care. It's like you're not smart and you do still care They all go to the beach where it looks really cold. I'm like this is straight up winter on the prairie. Bella sees Jacob again, who tells the story about how his tribe is said to have descended from actual wolves. And she's like, wow, that's so interesting. And they somehow, their ancestors were in a, they don't get along with the Colin family or whatever, or the locals. And then we go over to butt crack Santa from the diner and he gets killed by three of uh, those shadowy figures, but we see their faces and they talk through, there's like three of them. I don't remember any of their names, but I'm telling my kids they were the black eyed peas. My favorite is the Fergie woman who gets um, recast after this. She was their second choice. And they killed butt crack Santa. Also, Bella does a research montage being like cold people. And they, uh, she finds a book that she wants to go get out of town. So she follows the girls prom dress shopping so that she can tag along and go to the bookstore. But then when she goes to meet the girls at the restaurant later, she apparently walks through the shady side of town. What's up, girl? Hey, dude, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang out with us? Come on, come on. Come on. It's fun. What's the problem? She doesn't like that, man. You're pretty. Don't, don't touch really, me. Man. You really no, she seriously, like you should. Your mom. I understand the movie can only sort of insinuate what criminal motives this, I guess it's not really a gang. We'll call them warmly dressed outdoor boys. But why are they all saying such weird things to sound menacing? All of a sudden, a bunch of guys wearing ski pants shows up and they're like, Red Rover, Red Rover, send this girl right over. Bella, run, it's the roving Red Rover gang and they're dressed for a snow day. I feel like this marauding group of youngsters is a really jarring anomaly within what seemed before like a really quaint, safe, small town. And Bella's dad is the sheriff, right? Because if he's smart, he'll look at this attempted assault on his daughter as an opportunity to improve. Bella is being manhandled at an alarming rate when Edward swerves up in his whatever car, you know, the kids loved whatever car it was silver Corolla or something stupid. And he gets out and intimidates the bad boys, the greasers, until they leave to the next town, I guess. That was a very dangerous maneuver. Way to go, Edward. Now those guys understand how uncomfortable it is when a creepy man is staring at them. Is this how girls feel when we look at them with our murder eyes? Meanwhile, Bella just learned an important lesson that in this town, it's best to be inside when the students from the HVAC repair school get out. I'm not saying HVAC repair people are criminals. The HVAC school in Forks, Washington was built on cursed ground. Anyway, they go to dinner and we get further evidence that Edward is the hottest person alive. I'm not saying that um, what's his name who plays Edward Robert Pattinson isn't hot obviously he is but um, he's not everyone's type like he seems like one of those people who as a kid they couldn't get to eat enough to stay on the growth curve is that mean to say I'll decide if I want to cut it out later <laughs> so are you sure there isn't anything I can get for you 
No, no, thank you. Just let me know. It's hard to explain, but I feel like that's the person Megan Trainer would be if she never had a hit song. No, wait. That was easy to explain. Sorry, I'm just jealous because this server is flirting with Edward in front of Bella, and she found the perfect look for when you have a shift waiting tables at eight and a USO tour entertaining the troops back in 1914. Edward lets on that he understood what those hooligans were thinking and wanted to do to her, and he basically is like, I don't have the strength to stay away from you anymore. And Ella's like, holy shit, I am that if someone said this to me as a teenager, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'll die for you. I get it. Teenagers want to feel like they belong. Oh, but then when they're driving home, they see Edward's dad and Bella's dad, because the one physician is also the one coroner in the town, and the one police officer is the one police officer, and they're investigating butt crack Santa's murder. This makes it really real, the animal attacking, because that's someone that your dad was friends with. Bella starts looking through her ancient book and making connections between what she's noticed about Edward being cold to the touch, like when their hands touched in the car and him having superhuman strength. She's starting to get it. And that day at school, she starts walking into the forest and he just follows her. Now where I'm from, they would be going to have sex, but I, don't, I think they just wanna have a talk, a heart to heart. Ella, Bella, Ella, Bella, Ella, A, 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 lists out all the evidence she's collected. You're impossibly fast and strong. Your skin is pale white and ice cold. You speak like, like you're from a different time. You never eat or drink anything. You don't go out in the sunlight. You have a castle in Transylvania, you play the pipe organ, and you sleep in a coffin. She really just pulled out a running Google Doc called Weird Vampire Stuff About Edward That Everyone Should Be Noticing. How has Edward's family kept, and all vampires, I guess, kept this secret from humanity for so many years when they all literally turn into bats and fly away in the parking lot of Whole Foods if there's a full moon or a new moon? Book title. I don't understand Edward's stance here. He's like, you have to say what I am out loud. Say it! It's like, well, you're loud, first of all. You're screaming in my ear. I know what you are. Say it. Say it. Vampire. Imagine how embarrassing it would be if he was like, what? No, I'm just hiding a congenital blood disease. And since when does he talk like he's from another time? Is she talking about the time he said endure with a British accent? Just have to endure it. Poor Bella is so confused. She's like, oh, he's a red coat. No, sweetie, this is normal times. He's a vampire. Apparently, this is the first time anyone's ever guessed that Edward's a vampire. So he's like, gotta take her to a separate location. Never go to a second location with the vampire who is obsessed with the way your blood smells. Where are we going? Out of the cloud bank. You need to see what I look like in the sunlight. Okay, let me just reset my arm back into the socket real quick. Can I bite down on your belt to keep from screaming? They zoom up the mountain at, uh, you know, superhuman speed. Although the physics of Edward's Naruto run never feel quite right to me. Maybe because the background is zooming by, yet Bella's hair is experiencing the most gentle summer breeze. Also, it causes she and Edward to shapeshift into some stunt performers having the time of their lives. <laughs> Oh my God, what is that? It's also a good time to talk about that blue filter that they have pasted over all of this movie. I find it really, uh, like, it takes away from the quality of the movie, especially since they could have easily done it in a way that feels a little more natural. I just reset the colors and like mess with them a little. I'm not even that good at this. Then ask me the most basic question. What do we eat? Bella's like, I really hope the answer is but I have a feeling it's blood. Sad trombone. I always like trying to see what some of these movies look like without their insane color correction because that looks like one of the photo booth filters that was on my 2005 MacBook. To me, the natural looking color balance is more effective at selling the cool, foggy atmosphere of this rainforest. There's plenty of blue in the background that uh, was captured in camera because the cinematographer and the gaffers were all doing their job. It seems like Overkill just slap like a strong blue filter over the whole frame, including people's faces. It's like, uh, the movie Avatar called and I didn't answer because that movie sucks. You know what I'm saying? F you and your blue characters. Wd -w die. In this scene, Edward's like, I have a girlfriend and she is so blue. So when Edward steps into the sunlight, we finally realize why they have to live in the cloudiest place on earth. It's like diamonds. Beautiful. Beautiful. This is the skin of a killer, Bill. 
Okay, well, can it also be the skin of someone who practices their facial expressions in the mirror at home? Because that glittery angst was reading as more sparkly constipated. This is where the movie, for me, reaches the point where it looks like the peak parody of itself. Like, that looked like it was from a Wayans Brother movie. After learning that he's a killer, Bella shows some more of that trademark good judgment. I'm designed to kill. I don't care. I've killed people before. It does not matter. I wanted to kill you. Give it up, Edward. It seems like that's the part that turns her on most of all. Bella's like, uh, you could kill my little cousin right in front of me and I would help you hide the body. Do you not get it? I'm sick. Bella sh gets a little <laughs> stage show of all of his abilities. He runs over here. He's like, I'm fast, I'm strong, I'm loud. And she's like, and I'm wet. <laughs> that turns her right on. So he's finally like, oh, I've been waiting for a human girl to feel vulnerable enough to put up with all of that. I'm not afraid of you. I'm only afraid of losing you. So the lion fell in love with the lamb. And the lamb didn't have a lot of healthy relationships modeled for her back in Phoenix. That makes her really fun and easy for the lion to manipulate. You guys met like half a semester ago, right? And even then Edward was absent for 10 days because he hated how strong you smell. So I definitely feel like things are moving just a little fast for me. I also don't know the time frame. I guess the winter formal is supposed to be a, or the prom is like at the end of the year. So we're getting closer to that. I don't know. There's too much other sh shit going on in this movie for me to feel confident in that. The school is obviously so impressed that Bella got the coolest guy, but it makes sense. They're both the coolest people. Bedward, Bedward, that's a fun name for them. Edward tells a story of how he was dying of the Spanish flu and Carlisle saved him by turning him into a vampire. And um, they're not like other vampires. We think of ourselves as vegetarians, right? Cause we only survive on the blood of animals. So the exact opposite of vegetarians? Got it. I understand Edward says he feels like they're the vampire equivalent of vegetarians, but that doesn't feel accurate. Cause in fact, he's just a carnivore who avoids certain types of prey. Like that mountain lion that stopped attacking me because a yeast infection had made my blood toxic. I'm just saying they already have an example of what Edward is in the animal kingdom. So the vegetarian thing just makes it seem like he doesn't quite understand vegetarianism. It's like a human only living on tofu keeps you strong, but you're never fully satisfied. It's not how food works, but okay, snaggle fangs. The story logic throughout this whole franchise feels like it was written by a 14 year old doing fan fiction. And I say that with all due respect to Stephanie Meyer, who wrote this book at age 29. For anyone who's just listening to the audio of this video, I'm giving my most disgusting eye roll right now. Like it actually hurts. Like Stephanie, girl, there's something called writing a second draft. You should have tried it out here. He keeps being like, you know how people who eat tofu hate it? No, entire countries have had that as one of their main protein sources. Just because this book was written by an American, they're like, protein is not real food. Anyway, Edward totally runs off when Jacob and his dad show up. And so Bella's not quite sure what that's about, but there seems to be some tension there. They're all worried about the animal that's killing all of the disposable characters in this movie. Adult men, no kids or children or women were harmed by this vampire. But then Edward takes Bella to his beautiful forest home to have dinner and meet the family. The family seems really nice. They're like, her name's Bella. She must be Italian, right? Which I love. It is like, what is her ethnicity? She doesn't even have a f the safe flavor of salt that her sweat should have. So what, where is she from? Bella, we're making Italiano for you. Giving us an excuse to use the kitchen for the first time. I hope you're hungry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she already ate. Nobody even flinched. Yeah, Rosalie, we all knew you were waiting for a chance to do something crazy when you started making a salad with leather gloves on. I'm with Bella, I'd be like, no offense, but I'm not eating food cooked by people who haven't eaten food since before Giardia was discovered. And also who would die if they touched garlic salt. By the way, I'm always excited to see one of my favorite performers, Paget Brewster on the screen. I didn't realize this was her cause she looks so different. I guess I'm not used to seeing her with this much digitally blurred wig lace on the face, but I do like that hair color on her. So what about it? Lacy, lacy, say my Gracie. Also, my new mantra is, Bella, we're making Italiano for you. We learned some other things about Edward that are stupid, like he doesn't sleep, so he doesn't have a bed. I'm like, yeah, but don't you want to lay down to read? It's still nice to relax. He's like, no, no, no bed. I figured when we 
topic, I'll just bend you over my dictionary. <laughs> also, Edward can play the piano in a hazy room. The police are looking for whatever killed those animals. Stephanie Meyer does a cameo as someone getting served a burger. She's writing a book. What if she's writing the book that this movie is based on? Bella and her dad are getting a little bit closer, noticing they have stuff in common at these diner sessions. Oh, and then later, Bella is giving her mom the 411. Do you do that a lot? Just the past couple of months. I like watching you sleep. Bella's like, and I incorrectly love being watched while I sleep. Has it been every single night, including the time I diarrheaed myself with food poisoning? They kiss, but they don't have sex. She has no pants on. She seems ready to go, but he said, no, we have to wait until later, till the third act. But they do sleep together, wholesomely. Of course, the dad is cleaning his shotgun when it's time to meet Edward, but you know, he meets Edward. These young adult romances always have to have the parent being like, I'm suspicious, but I guess I'll allow this 30 year old to date my 14 year old. Oh, and then Bella is brought on a thundery day. So the, the Collins don't go to school on sunny days, but they also wait till thundery days to not go to school. It's like, you just, any weather. So Bella's like, why do you only play baseball on thundery days? And here we find out. It's time. Okay, now I see why you need the thunder. I guess, but I don't see why they need to play baseball because it seems like a very stupid thing for vampires to care about. Seeing all of the Cullens wearing their twee little vintage baseball caps certainly kills any of the mystery and allure that these characters were introduced with, doesn't it? Bunch of nerds. They're playing baseball when those three figures that we know have been killing the people of the town come out of the woods because they smelled Bella, just like everyone does. First, people are playing things kind of nice, but then a threatening air bubbles to the surface. What about first? I'm the one with the wicked curveball. Oh, well, I think we can handle that. Oh no. Let's go back to making sure all of his lines get cut. He's a weird little peanut head, isn't he? With, frankly, a more threatening aura than the actual antagonists in this scene. Oh, well, I think we can handle that. Still not quite as strange as this terrible day for night filter. But at least in this case, it does actually help distract from the fact that the camera is getting too close to these actors and the shadow is on their faces. <laughs> we shall see. Does anyone else feel like the only reason this baseball scene is in the movie is because Stephanie Meyer had a fantasy where an entire sports game suddenly became about her and protecting how special she is? Because they uh, realize these people want Bella and they're like, we'll see you soon. So they throw her into the car and start driving off somewhere. And Bella's like, are those people after me now? Oh, I'm just so desirable that now the bad guys want me too. What am I gonna do? So this is like suddenly an emergency. The third act comes quick. So Bella runs into her her house pretending to be fighting with Edward so that she can lock herself in her room and her dad won't notice. Or no, she says, I think she grabs her stuff. She's like, I'm going to visit mom so that she can run away and hide for the appropriate amount of time to keep the dad safe. Edward takes Bella to the Cullen's house where one of those bad guys from the baseball game has grown tired of the other guy being mean, I guess, and is warning them about mm, the girl and him and the plan. Meanwhile, I think it's Alice who has visions of the future and kind of can see Bella's like, I don't know, the studio where she used to do ballet, which we have barely heard about, I think ever in this. So much goes on in this 10 minutes that I'm like actually annoyed. Jasper and Alice are gonna drive Bella south to be safe. Bella's having flashbacks. Alice sees the ballet studio. Oh, and then Bella gets a phone call from the guy, the bad guy, and he has apparently kidnapped her mom. Although, you can kind of hear, it sounds suspicious on the phone, but he's like, you better come find us at your ballet studio or she gets it. It's a nice house you have here. I was prepared to wait for you. But then mom came home after she received a very worried call from your dad. Again, with these weird out of place flashes, if they're doing that to distract me from how Bella's hand doesn't match her face, it's not working. And once again, the camera operator has a real issue with personal space. I really don't like when you can see the camera shadow on the actor's face. It's like, I shouldn't be aware that there's a camera. <laughs> anyway, Bella is threatened that the mom gets it if she brings any of the Collins with her. So being the idiot that she is, she's like, great, I'll just go take care of it myself as a weak human who will die instantly. But don't worry, she's having a great time through all of it. I can't bring myself to regret the decisions that brought me face to face with death. They also brought me to Edward. 
Yeah, but it also brought vampires to your mom's house and then they kidnapped and tortured her. But good, I'm, I'm glad you're so proud of the situation you've created because you have a boyfriend now. But don't worry, because as soon as Bella gets there, she realizes her mom is nowhere to be found. It's just a recording from a home video that he got and she's been duped into death. And uh, that guy, I'm sorry, I don't know his name, but not that sorry. He starts to bite Bella. He actually bites her wrist. And that's when Edward jumps in with the Cullens and the Cullens go right, this feels really anticlimactic to me. She's like turning into a vampire and her vision's all blurry. And we just see the silhouette of the Cullens ripping that bad guy apart. Although the curly haired lady gets away. We know that ripping the vampire apart is the only way to destroy their immortal bodies. And they burn his head. I do love seeing the like mannequin get ripped apart. <laughs> and she's like <sighs> having an aneurysm. So Bella Bella has to have the same thing to her done. Oh no, know what happens? It's not the same as when Edward got turned into a vampire. Bella is turning into a vampire, but Edward has to suck the poison blood out like a snake bite. However, even though it's the most delicious nectar on earth, he cannot drink too much of it or she'll die. Just has to get the poison out. <laughs> Edward, stop. Yeah, Edward, stop sucking your girlfriend off. It's making her go cross-eyed. Bella loses consciousness with a flash of fantasies about laying in the field with Edward. And when she wakes up in the hospital, the mom is there and they're like, the whole accident has been explained. The mom is like, you fell and broke your leg. You don't remember any of this. And Edward has been sleeping there by her side forever, even though we know he's pretend sleeping because he doesn't sleep. So he's just eavesdropping. And then when the mom leaves, he's like, I'm so glad you're okay, but. Bella, you gotta go to Jacksonville. Are you, how, I don't even know what you're saying. How, what are you, what are you talking about? No, I, I can't, I can't just leave you. Ooh, I see you, Bella. And this is a really great technique to avoid someone breaking up with you. I'm gonna write this tip down. Pretend to have a seizure. So right before this, Bella's mom was like, you should come back to Jacksonville with me. And she's like, no, I wanna stay in Forks. But Edward is like, you gotta go to be safe. Why is it her job to pick up and move for her safety? Seems like the transient vampire family who has been doing this for years would have an easier time of making that move. They have no real identities and no family already. And honestly, I don't know how moving across state lines is going to stop these evil vampires from going after Bella. They can run fast. And she's just too pretty and popular. Bella is basically like, uh, well, you don't understand. I'm gonna throw a fit if you break up with me and apparently lose my mind. So you're stuck here. So Edward is basically like, all right, fine. I'm not going anywhere, Jesus. And there you go. Now they're stuck forever going to prom. Edward's dad is like, I trust you a little. Oh, Jacob is like, there's still weirdness between Jacob and Edward, but we don't know why yet. Just wait till he cuts his hair for some reason. While they're dancing in the gazebo, Bella is like, Listen, Edward, baby, I'm gonna need you to put those fangs right back into my neck and suckle a little blood out. I need to be a vampire with you so that we can be high school lovers forever. So I'm just like, do not do this, girl. You don't wanna live forever. He hates his life. He's so pale. So he tells her, he's like, it's the most painful thing on earth and you don't know what you're asking for, so I'm not gonna do it. And she's like, all right, for now, maybe not tonight. Babe, this is becoming an undead monster, not trying anal. You need to take it more seriously. But voiceover Bella lets us know this is not the end of that argument. I know what I want. Uh-oh, I have a feeling she'll be back. I mean, we'll never see this actress again. Not after Bryce Dallas Howard's schedule clears up, but you know what I mean. There's gonna be like 16 more movies of this. So a -ch 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 roll the credits. Whew, this was a long one and a long awaited one. What do you all think of the Twilight series? Should I just keep doing the Twilight movies or can I do like two a month until we're through them? Let me know what you feel like in the comments below, but I'm not Bella, so I don't do whatever you undead vampires tell me. Oh, now I'm being mean for no reason. Love you so much. Thank you so much for watching and getting into Twilight number one with me. Don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see more from the Twilight movie series really fast, but most importantly, click that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single video from me to every week. Also, I've got merch and a Patreon where you can access virtual watch parties and extra content. Oh, and turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when we're drinky drinking blood blood. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for ripping vampires apart at a bonfire with me. I will see you next time.